in language education. She holds master and doctorate degrees in applied linguistics from Columbia University of New York. Evelina currently serves as the non-executive trustee for the International Research Foundation for English Language Education, which promotes effective English language education in multilingual contexts. And she is also the co-editor for the Language Assessment Quarterly Journal. And Dr. Nahakalabashi is a senior lecturer in language assessment at Sequela. She holds a PhD in education from the University of Oxford. Her research interests include the assessment of speaking, the impact of technology in assessment, multimodality and new constructs in digital age. Nahal currently serves as the chair of the British Association of Applied Linguistics in Testing, Learning and Assessment. Unfortunately, due to some unforeseen circumstances, um, Evelina couldn't be with us this afternoon. So Nahal will be presenting on behalf of Evelina and also the full research team, which includes um, Professor Fumi, Fumio Lekasahara at Krela, Hannah Allen and Sefato Lobs from Cambridge University Press and Assessment, as well as our PhD student Catherine Hollywood at Krela. So over to you now, Nahal. Thank you very much, Sathina. And yeah, Evelina sends her sincere apologies, and I really hope I'll be able to uh, do the research justice and present the views of the team well but Fumi and Katie are in uh, are here today so they'll, they're here to answer any difficult questions that you may have can I just check that you can see the screen and that you can hear me anyone can tell me yep that's great thank you we can I can we can see your sides beautifully and hear you lovely and clearly Nahal thank you brilliant thank you so much Okay, so our talk today is going to be about exploring the impact of generative AI on language education, uh, insights from teachers. So I'm sure, you know, with all the buzz that's around generative AI, you're all familiar with what it is, but let's just provide a little bit of um, background to set the scene for the project. So generative AI is considered now a major disruptor in education. It's a really powerful technology. It's now widely available um, and actually socially accepted. Uh, to, to some extent. Uh, some, there's a lot of uh, discussions around whether, for example, higher education should allow students to use it or not, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Just to give you uh, just uh, maybe some statistics just to do, um, set, set the scene even better. So ChatGPT, which is one of the, the major generative AI tools, had a million users in five days when it was introduced. Um, it had 100 million, 100 million users plus after six months. And I last I checked this morning, visited approximately 1.6 billion times over the last 30 days. And this was an increase of 170 percent from February 2023. And there are over 13 million unique visitors per day, which is just absolutely astonishing. So just and, and just as comparison, when the Apple II computer came in 1997, we had then IBM PC in 1981 and the Mac in 1984. It took them until the early 1990s before there were 100 million PCs in use. And that should just give us a, a, a fair idea of the, the pace and just the, the, the power of the technology and the pace with, with which it's moving. So the new generation of AI models, so we're all to some extent familiar with some predictive models, the more traditional, let's say, models, where, for example, you could, um, what they were doing is you, you would um, be able to identify a photo of a dog, uh, or you would be able to classify a learner's script is something that, you know, we, we did in um, lots of automated scoring of written or speak, a spoken language, or, for example, find information on a particular topic. What's happening now with the generative models is that rather than identify a photo of a dog, you'd be able to actually tell the, the tool to create an image of a dog. You can even tell it that you want the dog to be flying and to be pink and you know to have stars above its head. Um, so you can also, instead of classifying a learner's script, you can actually write a learner essay um, in, in, in different formats and you can tell it to write it in C1 language or C2 language and the, the, the different kinds of length, for example, for different kinds of audience. You can, instead of finding information on a topic now, you can actually produce a recommendation. And there's a, a lot more that the new generative AI models are capable of doing. We know that the impact on education is absolutely massive. So 
there's whenever there are new technologies, Punya Mishra talks about this doom hype cycle. So where in the doom hypothesis, they'd say that this AI is going to be the end of teaching or the end of learning. That's the way we know it. It's going to be the end of traditional school classrooms, for example, leading experts say. There's also the hype cycle that this is going to be so exciting. Everybody's going to learn languages in a completely different way. So we have the doom hype cycle. But what we, what I think, what the the um, some of the research out there is saying, some of the um, reports that are coming out, so no matter what the technology is doing, jobs in the education industry are actually expected to grow by about 10%, mm. and that the generative AI is going to really impact um, education. It's one of the top five industries that's going to be particularly impacted by education and uh, by generative AI, and it's going to be growing. Okay, this remains to be seen. However, while there are hundreds and like thousands of opinion pieces on the use of generative AI in language education, there's actually quite limited uh, research about it out there. And there's there we it's quite important for us to start gathering empirical insights on how teachers and perhaps students, this is a focus of another to topic, would are actually using the technology. So not what they would like the technology to do or what you know we what their attitudes are towards it, but how teachers are actually using the technology. And this is with the perhaps the overarching aim of to helping um, teachers become more AI ready, which is something that luck and the term he has coined 2022 or she I had to check that. So uh, just a little bit of background about the research landscape in which our study is, is, uh, is set in. So there's a lot of research coming out from government and non for profit organizations. So, for example, UNESCO um, produced AI in education guidance for policymakers. There's some Ofcom reports about mis misinformation, media literacy. There's things about from the World Economic Forum about the future of jobs. And if you're interested, I can send you some of these links. There's research coming out from tech firms, so from like Capgemini or RM Technology, again, looking at how um, AI might be affecting education. And there's perhaps more um, you know, smaller scale studies coming out of academic institutions, where there's looking at student perceptions of and experiences of AI by Chan and Hu, uh, or um, the, and the, you know, what are the, the um, uh, comparisons. There's a lot of research looking at comparisons of huma, human and AI generated texts. And the last bit of the research landscape is what the work that's been done by ELT organizations. So, for example, OUP, both OUP and the British Council, they had um, papers coming out looking at AI in education. Um, and uh, so the BC one as well are preparing what is the artificial intelligence and English language teaching preparing for the future. And this is very much where our study sits in. So research that has been fo focusing particularly on English language teaching and English language teachers done by ELT organizations, in, and this was a joint study with Cam between Cambridge and Quella. So what we were particularly interested in is to investigate the uses of and attitudes towards generative AI in language education, and I'll talk you through uh, our particular study. So the aim of our study, we have three aims. We wanted to gather empirical insights about language teachers' practices, attitudes, and the challenges and hurdles that they faced in using generative AI tools. We wanted to establish current trends and examine their implications for the future. I think it's really worth noting here that we completed the data collection for the study over the summer of 2023. And whatever I'm talking to you about today might not necessarily be the current trend on this particular day because, um, because of the pace, as I said, and the growth of, um, of generative AI in the last few months. However, even if the, the, cur the trends are, are only fairly current, um, we think that this is a very useful way of establishing a baseline, uh, which would be quite useful for making future comparisons with other studies that are being done in the area. And lastly, we wanted to inform teachers' professional development on the basis of the study. So the methods that we used, so we used um, an online survey that consisted of 27 questions. We had a mix of both closed and open-ended questions. The survey went through several rounds of reviews and piloting um, internally between us and also at Cambridge. The areas of interest that we identified were familiarity with and uses of generative AI in teaching. We wanted to look at the benefits and the challenges of generative AI. We wanted to look at the training needs of our, our teachers. And we also were interested in institutional policies related to generative AI, as well as teachers' attitudes towards the technology. 
we also conducted three focus groups, and this was really to get into a little bit more depth um, from some of the things that were coming out in our surveys. We wanted to get more depth and get um, a wider range of perspectives from, from, uh, from our participants. So we had nine teachers in total, and we have three online sessions for the focus groups. And um, this really allowed us to bring in like this diversity and bring a bit more depth to the, the, what we had gathered in the surveys. For analysis, we use quantitative data analysis, descriptive and inferential statistics. And for the qualitative data analysis, we did thematic coding. And my, our PhD student, Katie, who is in the audience, will be able to tell you exactly how she went about doing the qualitative data analysis if anybody had any questions. So this is kind of how what the, uh, the, the, the makeup of our participant looks like. Uh, we have 386 teachers from 70 countries and across six different continents. So the majority of our teachers were female, about 73%. The age range was, again, between about 36 to 55 for the majority, about 60%. And we had a range of teaching experience from 10 years until, uh, up to about 29 years. And we tried to cover both public and private sectors, although private sectors were the majority, 63%. We also tried to cover a range of classroom sizes and a range of domains, so like general English and English for academic purposes and business English. So this we tried really try to uh, include a range of voices and experiences in terms of our participants. So four key themes emerged from our data analysis, and I will take you through each one of them one by one. The first theme was um, strong uptake and positive attitudes. So our teachers reported frequent use of generative AI tools and express very positive attitudes. And this really highlights the integral role that they assign to generative AI in language education. So uh, an, a teacher in Hungary said, I think it is essential that we keep up to date with the development of AI and to incorporate it into our everyday teaching. To our surprise, um, we, we, we really were surprised that familiarity with generative AI was quite high. So about 51% of our participants were mostly familiar or very familiar, familiar with generative AI. Uh, only 14% at the time were not at all familiar. And I think if we were to conduct the study today, this figure might be a lot lower given you know, the, the, the increase in use of um, these tools. So we also just, um, in addition to asking whether they're familiar with whether they were familiar with generative AI, we also asked them whether were they were using teachers were using them in their everyday teaching and perhaps not just in their personal lives. Over a third of our teachers said 40% they use it on a weekly basis. About a third use it once or twice a month, and less than a third never use it. So a teacher in Uruguay, I use it every week to help with creating new activities and get ideas on how to teach certain topics. And I'll actually get to this about how they use the, the, the tools in a, in, a, in a later slide. And a teacher from Kenya also said, AI is so far my best teaching tool. We also asked, um, given, given again what I said about the doom hype cycle around new technologies and how you know this might be the end of, uh, end of the role of teachers in higher, in, in education, uh, we asked a statement, I think the generative AI tools might replace the role of the teacher as the main educator. And actually most or 73% of our participants did not believe that generative AI will replace them as the main educator or to make their roles redundant, basically. So what they said, they really talked about the role of human agency. Um, so the head of a private language school in Argentina talked about the skill, the choice and the decision. It is still under our own responsibility. AI is not going to solve the way in which we learn or the way in which we teach. The majority also believe that generative AI can usefully complement teaching and it can also be successfully integrated with the teacher's role. So our teacher in Italy said, I think AI helps students and teachers to improve teaching and learning abilities. Not everyone, however, shares this optimism. So, and this was really captured in a quote by a, um, by a teacher in a pilot study, and I, I will read this out to you. The teacher said, what's the difference going to be between having you, dear listener, or an AI robot teach you your next English class? I can see zillions of ways the robot will be better than you. It doesn't need pay, it doesn't go on strike, no bathroom breaks, never feels tired, never feels fed up, can quote from millions of books by heart and teach grammar as well as the best. And I'm sure that it will soon be quite as entertaining as you 
because of its fabulous memory? And who will the students like better as a teacher? So a bit of food for thought, and you, you can post about this if you like in the link that Nikki shared. We also there they thought generative AI will make language learning any less important, and actually the opinions were quite you know, diverse on this. So about half of our respondents doubted that generative AI will make language learning less less important. However, they were there were some who disagreed. So um, the head of a private language school in Argentina said, I've had some discussions with other teachers who think that artificial intelligence is killing learning. And for those of you who are fans of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the idea of a babelfish like or babelfish like technology, which instantaneously translates everything you hear in your ear, may really not be that far from the future. So, you know, learning English might become like learning Greek and Latin. But I think what is perhaps more realistic is that we will turn our attention to different aspects of language learning. Um, and this might change, as suggested by this teacher in the UK. So I think the sub skills that we teach students will change a bit. So perhaps we might have more reading, more evaluating of output, and it, things might be more speech based, for example, in the classroom, given that the, the, the technology will be very good at writing. The other thing that emerged was the use of AI as teaching assistant. A lot of our teachers talked about how they use they, they use AI as an assistant or a work buddy. Uh, it's also not surprising, I think, that Microsoft has called um, its, its one of its AI tools uh, its co-pilot. So teachers uh, said that they use generative AI to generate teaching ideas, adapt learning materials to, for the diverse student abilities. They talked about how it reduced their workload and enabled more personalized rating for their personalized learning for their students. So I've told my students to think of it as a tutor. Anything they would ask me, they can ask it. When asked about the top ways that our, the participants were using generative AI, these are in, in descending order, creating learning materials, what the, was what was used for the most, to help speed up tasks, to adapt materials to student abilities, used by 10%, and to create assessments. So that basically, um, the tool allowed teachers to be a lot more efficient. But it also allowed them to generate more ideas. So two thirds of the teachers talked about how they get unique insights and perspectives from the tools that they had not thought of themselves. So generative AI affords the ability to perceive ideas from a different point of view. So they also talked about um, the, 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 the tools that acts again like as a buddy or a teacher collaborator or a team member. So they said uh, they use the tool to review student work, to provide feedback, to help with multi-level classes, and to better address individual learner needs. So our teacher in Bosnia, Bosnia Herzegovina said it also served as a second pair of eyes when reviewing materials. Uh, another um, another teacher in Egypt talked about the adapting material to the student needs to be extremely crucial to remove barriers and suit individual references, which really relates to themes of equality, diversity, and inclusion. And overall, the teachers talked a lot about how the, the, the that the use of generative AI has helped increase their motivation, their engagement, and their confidence. They also talked specifically about how um, the tool allows them to focus on a range of specific language skills, both them and their students. So for example, a teacher in Italy said, um, the tool can help the students improve their writing level. So her C1 level writing, she creates the text, then asks ChatGPT if it is at the level and how it can be improved. Another teacher in Spain said, I've used ChatGPT to create tailored text for reading comprehension activities. And again, students can assess their knowledge with AI tools, pretending to chat with someone using the target language. And you know, given the processing power of, of ChatGPT and other AI tools, that it really feels like you can chat instantaneously with somebody. So not everything was positive. So the, the, our participants also highlighted certain challenges and concerns. Cheating and plagiarism were seen as a major challenge, as well as the diminishing of critical thinking skills. So a um, teacher in Ecuador talked about sometimes students tend to look for answers on ChatGPT instead of analyzing and thinking critically. And what we saw is that challenges really go beyond language learning. It's not really just about language learning here. One of some of the most prominent challenges were misinformation and blurring of boundaries between truth and fiction, cheating and plagiarism, as I mentioned earlier and diminishing of critical thinking skills, but also encouraging shallow learning. 
So fast access, the way this was commented on, that fast access to problem solving might result in shallow learning. And some additional things also emerged from the qualitative analysis. So this was over-reliance, for example, on generative AI, um, and the quality or lack thereof of generated output. And this is uh, you know, what we refer to as bias or hallucinations. So a teacher in Spain said AI is imperfect, and often the output is heavily dependent on the quality of the prompt submitted. And this is also goes back to the, the, the perhaps the skill that we need for prompt engineering. We'll get back to this as well. And some of our um, teachers, a teacher in Kenya, particularly talked about concern about un unequal access to technology. There are students who have no access to AI, and I feel they're a disadvantage as compares to those who do have access. Institutional policies on the use of AI were also found to be mixed and not always transparent. Um, uh, the highest proportion, they said, of our teachers, they said they're unsure whether their school or institution allows the use of generative AI. And some of them reported that they are allowed to use it. A small minority were not allowed to use it. And the statistics actually were different for whether staff were allowed to use it compared to whether students were allowed to use it. There were also ethical implications for of the, the use of generative AI and the need to safeguard students' data. And these were really some of the main concerns on, uh, uh, on the minds of our participants. So a bilingual school teacher in Argentina says there's a conversation going on about educators worried about the use of ChatGPT and the ethical implications that sometimes it carries with it. And also the um, English, again, a, a teacher in UK said, uh, raising awareness, promoting a safe and participated use of AI among students should be carried out. And these concerns are actually supported in some of the recent research um, on uh, some other research on slightly in, in, in using different methodology. So in a study called Seeing ChatGPT Through Students' Eyes, researchers analyzed the content of the 100 most popular videos in English, which was tagged with hashtag ChatGPT on TikTok. And these collectively, these videos had over 250 million views. And what the researchers found was that the majority of the videos promoted the use of ChatGPT without any hesitation. And by that, they mean that there, there was no critical engagement with the tool. Uh, or the limitations of the technology. And based on the research, I quote Hanch et al, 2023, from what we have seen, the risks of producing eloquent but incorrect responses and similar limitations of ChatGPT, like inherent biases of the produced output, are currently very underrepresented on the most popular social media platform among younger people. We therefore want to stress the importance of promoting responsible AI usage in educational settings, including discussions about ethical considerations and limitations, which, as you can see, really mirrors what our participants are saying here. And finally, our, uh, our last thing was training and professional development hurdles. There was a very high demand for training, signaling, signaling teachers strong desire to learn how to use generative AI well. At this time, they talked about very limited professional de development opportunities as a major hurdle. So uh, a teacher in Germany said any teacher who is not using AI is already behind. There was a lot of interest and a lot of enthusiasm to learn more. So a vast majority felt very enthusiastic to learn more about generative AI. And some of them were quite specific about what they needed, some were more general. But in the case of this uh, teacher in Japan, I need more training in terms of helping students use AI in a way that meets academic integrity rules and also helps them understand their responsibilities. And another teacher in Brazil, I need to know how to ask the right questions in order to receive an accurate answer from ChatGPT, again, to highlighting the role of prompt engineering here. And this is really like the, 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 the gist and the su a summary of, the, of, of our, our main findings. And there's probably a lot of implications here, but a few things that we talked about um, as a team, and again, would be really interesting to see what, you're, what you think and what, you're, what you think the implications might be. So what we thought is that, for example, we're, we're probably looking at new skills that, uh, as a result of operating in a, a post-ChatGPT era, we would need different skills like, um, like um, uh, prompt engineering, but also we might need um, to think about different success criteria. 
you know, there might be an, a next generation learning and assessment solutions. We might be asking students instead of writing essays where we, we ask them to they can ask ChatGPT to produce an essay and then we ask them to improve it. Or if they are reading something on ChatGPT, we might ask them to think about how they can ensure like do fact checking. So there are lots of different ways in which we can try and incorporate the way students are, and teachers are using ChatGPT in order to think of more creative assessment solutions. There's also a lot of rather than thinking about policing academic misconduct because of all the concerns about um, plagiarism and thinking about how we can transform assessments and going perhaps beyond like the essay type that we've been using. And I also came across very recently, there was an article in The Guardian about how universities are, some universities, I think it was the University of Loughborough, has, that they're using really sophisticated technology. I think they were using holograms to give lectures by Einstein. And how when higher education institutes or other education institutes, when they use technology, it's called trailblazing and innovative and creative. And the minute that students use the technology, they're called cheaters and, you know, and, and they're uh, you know, accused of plagiarism. So the discourse around how we use these technologies are quite, is quite different for institutions and, and um, students. So again, something for us to, to think about and, and visit. And again, as highlighted, the ethical considerations and safe use gu guidelines um, for, for all of us professionals. And also to think about the digital divide, as as it was um, highlighted by one of the um, one of the teachers, in terms of um, uh, ensuring equal and ensuring access. Um, and this is something that we we've talked really didn't necessarily come up uh, in in our um, didn't necessarily come up in our data, but we know from from reading around the topic that, for example, in countries like Sweden, there has now been a ban on using digital devices in schools. Um, and these are countries, perhaps more wealthier countries, that are that they have, you know, they have the the let's say the luxury of being able to invest in high quality teachers and also being able to um, be more selective in the way that they use digital devices or generative AI tools. And there might be less affluent um, countries where they have no choice but to rely on technologies that are freely available and may not, again, have the luxury of investing in high quality teachers. And this is where we might see a big, big, a bigger divide uh, in the future. Again, something for us to think about. Um, and this is, by the way, this happens to be Evelina's son, Adi, uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, so he, he, we have to pay him royalties for this. So whether, the question was whether this is what learning is going to become. So you see a very solitary, uh, a solitary student sitting with a couple of, uh, actually two screens in front of them uh, while doing some work, or whether this, the, the, the other, this other picture of students sitting together, learning and laughing together might still hold value. And what we'd like to say that we need to use, uh, I definitely would love for this to happen is to, new, uh, to use artificial intelligence to augment human intelligence rather than completely get rid of it. And to leave you with one uh, quote that we all love in the team, the best current chess players are not humans nor machines, but humans working with machines to figure out the best move. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Nahal, for this uh, very, very useful presentations. You'll be pleased to know we have a whole lot of questions for you. Oh, dear. Uh, just, just to give you a breather, let me uh, tackle the first questions. So um, um, that is related to whether there will be recording of um, all the presentations. Um, we usually, with um, the author's um, permission, we usually upload um, all the recordings of um, the presentation of our seminar or all the previous seminars to Quella's website. So Nikki will put the link of the web our website on the chat. And also, if you have registered for the annual lecture, you will also receive the link um, through email later on. So now, how? Um, there are a few questions. So um, I just sort of um, sort of uh, put them into different categories. So you have some questions related to your research design, um, some clarifications for the findings, and also a few questions um, helping us to think about the ethics of using AI in language education. And if we still have time, then we'll talk about sort of like implications of your wonderful study. So should we start um, with the research design? So one of the um, um, uh, participants um, was wondering um, how you can you share some information about what you have done to ensure the 
construct validity of your questionnaire, so your tool, like how, how, how you design the question. So can you share a little bit more on that, please? I actually, on this point, I would really love to invite uh, Fumi and Katie to join me here. So Fumi uh, was the other lead um, investigator in the study, and we we actually designed the survey together. And Katie, who's here, she she did an uh, actually stellar, absolutely stellar job with the qualitative analysis. Fumi, would you like to take this one? Because I've talked a lot today. Thanks, Nahal. Yes, in terms of construct of validity, we have to really mention that um, in terms of like quantitative analysis, I, we admit that we don't, we didn't do a, um, any any sort of pre-analysis, um, for example, factor analysis or structural equ equation modeling to understand the construct of um, each um, uh, factor that we have me we measured. But for qualitative analysis, uh, um, we actually really we, we can really um, verify the <coughs> reliability and and validity of the analysis because uh, we went very rigorous an analysis probably katie can explain a bit more about that um katie if you're in, in the audience probably I hope she... oh maybe she, she has a difficulty joining us okay so uh briefly um speaking and um, we used in vivo and we um we had we, yeah, and we have. Uh, sorry, it's a max QDA. Sorry, sorry, and and we coded all the um, open-ended questions in the um, survey as well as uh, um, focus group question, focus group responses, and we went through iterative um, analysis. Um, Katie led the analysis, but Nahala and, and then I joined, and we three of us and we we established the consensus, and and we. Fair, fair, we are fairly confident about the validity of the of the analysis. Yeah, can I also add something to to about the actual survey itself? Is it just something about the project is that we really needed to get this survey out quickly. As you all know, like the, the again with anything to do with ChatGPT or generative AI, if you spend too much time, the the field has moved on. And Cambridge really was very keen for us to get the the survey out as soon as possible. This doesn't mean that we didn't we worked very hard on. Um, iteratively going through the survey, there were multiple internal reviews, then we send it to colleagues in Cambridge, and then we had other uh, the colleagues in Cambridge send it to other colleagues. So we, we did a lot of um, amending and adjusting of the surveys, but it really was just bec because we were, it, it was a survey looking at perspectives and also looking yeah. at experience. It, and also the survey needed to yeah. factor analysis. Sense. And, and the survey needed to yeah. be really brief because we needed to take to our teachers uh, uh, precious time so we had yeah. only 27 questions but that was one of the factors we managed to get almost 400 uh, teachers responses in a very short period of time yes great thank you so and then there are a couple of questions just to clarify some of the findings that Nahal mentioned um the, the first one is do, do you have any idea that whether the, the teachers use ai in english or in their first language um, we, I think the, the, one of our first questions was whether, oh, actually, whether they use it in their AI. That's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we might have it, we, we might have aspects of it, but I've, off the top of my head, I don't think we asked whether they were using it in their L1 or whether just it was for, for teaching English. So, sorry. Yeah, another question is about um, whether you have more sort of statistics to show how AI was used for different purposes. I think you, you did mention that um, briefly. Maybe in future publications, you would like to share more of the statistics. Yeah. Um, another question yeah. is about... Sathina, sorry, just, actually, I, I had that graph ready in, in front of me, so let, let me share. Oh, okay, you want <laughs> so, to share? 18% <laughs> so said that they create learning materials, and 13 said to help... Um, speed up their tasks and save time and 10 percent said um, to adopt materials to student abilities and 10 said to create tests so, so we have all the statistics ready so we are happy to share it yes and the, the report we're working on a report for this we should come out in a month's time and all the all the details will be there yeah fantastic okay and then um can i just clarify when you mentioned that teachers use ai to give feedback does it mean giving feedback in classroom or giving using ai to give feedback to student work and if you know any software um, that um that, that are useful for giving feedback as well 
Um, I don't think I'm, I'm in a position to say what software they use or how they were using it. I think they did mention we we because we had included a few different options. And again, when the report comes out, we can look at that. Um, but they um, they talked both about in classroom use and outside of classroom use. That's what they they actually distinguish between the two. Um, but whether they were, I'm not sure that they were specific about which software that they used to to to, to do that. And by the way, we. For, um, we all gave a, a, an IETEFL talk a few days ago um, where there were a lot of teachers there. And we found that we were actually quite ignorant about some of the uh, tools that the teachers were using. Uh, and they were much, much more generally AI savvy in terms of specific tools. So uh, whenever we find out, I'll share the details with you. So can I just can I just add that so Nahal um, started this presentation saying that generative AI is usually considered as a disruptor in education, but after this um, survey and then research, what we found is actually so many people consider generative AI as enabler in education. So it was really much more positive than we expected. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And um, I think this this to the the, the coming sets of questions regarding the ethics of using AI. So um. um so you quoted uh, one of you said anything that can ask me they can ask it so um one of the participants is wondering whether this is the, the the right approach that teaches students to sort of rely on the ai tool blindly and also another ethical concern is like sharing student content um to the yep. to the platform and then um they will become so sort of part of the data that they that they're training the tool so have you have any thoughts about sort of the ethical considerations I mean, I, I think this is why I, I, I particularly quoted the TikTok, uh, the, the, the TikTok study, because it's it's basically I think what what that study shows is that the we we as academics and as professionals in the field, we might be really concerned with the ethics of AI. But the younger generation who is using TikTok, and I personally don't really use TikTok, the younger generation who is using TikTok is actually not being exposed to any of the critiques that we're sharing here. So. There needs so I guess it's becomes the you know the, the the teachers if they are aware of this is for to to raise awareness amongst their students of of what the ethical concerns are, um, so that we are we're just a little that there's a bit more transparency and they're more informed of what the dangers are and actually when it, anytime you see something is free it's not really free they're you know they're mining your data so just that awareness um, bet, um amongst our students for uh, it's it's partly our responsibility and that's what some of the teachers in our study were saying mm -hmm. we need more guidelines as well yeah that leads to um the final questions for you so how do we prepare new teachers or how, how how can we better prepare teachers i think they're moving so fast i guess it's not just new teachers but teachers as a whole so do you have any idea or suggestions how teachers can be more um well equipped with the evolution of AI. Uh, for me, would you like to take this one? I think this is great. This is question for, for everyone attending in the, uh, this, this seminar. And one of the purposes of this study was really to inform teacher training. So hopefully those are uh, quotes, some people more AI ready, some people less AI ready. We, we understand that what needs to be done in teacher training. So that is one thing. And a few days ago, Evelina um, shared a really nice um, um, so, so sort of comments in, in, in that in that seminar we, we did uh, <coughs> this way. Uh, so when Pocket Calculator was introduced, we really thought that okay, we don't we don't we don't need to do a calculation anymore. But is it, it is so? It's not true. Our kids still need to um, learn times table. It is really basic, um, really fundamental. Um, knowledge that we need to have in order to understand more abstract math and that the same is happening happening in, in language education so we see some parity so we we still need to learn in english and we still need to have basics but we just need to know how to use the to the new tool that um all in a sudden appeared in front of us Thank you, Fumi. So on this happy note of learning timetables, I think we will end this session and people can get um, the copy and tea. And we will be back um, at, we will be back in 15 minutes. Am I correct? Yes. 3.25? Yeah, thank you so thank much, um, Naha and, and, and Fumi, for this wonderful presentation. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you very much. Yes, um, that's right. We'll be back at um, 3.25. Um, 
we'll put again we'll put the break time slides on so that after uh, when the music stops you'll know it's it's time to uh, come back but judging by the number of questions there Nahal and Fumi thank you very much it was a really interesting uh, presentation and I think maybe um, uh, that we'll, we'll let you have sight of those questions afterwards because there were lots more questions there that we didn't we didn't have time for so thank you very much <laughs>